Hello, everyone. Welcome to the GCN Cyclocross Podcast. I'm Jeremy Powers, one of the presenters here at GCN, and you could say I've got a thing for cyclocross. <laughs> so I'd like to think of this more as an adventure and less of a podcast, just because podcast sounds so, well, it doesn't sound that cool anymore. An adventure sounds way more fun. Today and future shows are going to be a mixture of different types of coverage from around the world. So first up, we're going to get into some racing analysis with my pal, Marty McDonald, who you guys have definitely heard if you've listened to any of the live races on GCN. Marty is that voice. Then we're going to have a weekly check-in with the three-time world champ, Edwin Verveke from the fields of Belgium. And then we're going to have a sit-down for our feature with the man, Lars Vanderhaar. And you're probably thinking, Jeremy, that is a lot of dudes on the show. And you'd be right. But Every single episode after this for the next three are going to be with different women. We have Katerina Nash, Evie Richards, as well as Magalie Rochette. So really excited to bring those interviews to you guys. And well, before I get into the show, I want to remind you guys that you can hit us up on GCN on social media, on Instagram at Global Cycling Network, on Twitter at GCN Tweet. Leave us a review. Please subscribe. And let's get into the show. Our first guest of the show is a man that needs no introduction, my friend, Marty McDonald. Marty, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Marty, before we get started, I just wanted to let the fans get a second to know a little bit more about who you are, because you introduce the racing every single weekend. But people might just know you as the voice, but they may not know anything about you. Can you please tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I first got involved in cycling way, way back. I was about 13 when I started. I raced the road, the track, mountain bikes, cyclocross, when everything was in black and white. <laughs> I was really lucky um, to get involved in TV back in the early 2000s, uh, commentating and presenting. My first job was out in Trinidad and Tobago. I've been involved in pro cycling, managing riders such as Magnus Backstead and in triathlon with Lisa Norden. I've, been a, I've owned a pro team. I've been a sport director with teams like Endura Racing and then in, in pro women's uh, cycling with Pearl Izumi and Dame Sarah Story Story Racing Team. And then the guys here at GCN asked if I would uh, would come and commentate here. So uh, I've lived a charmed life, man. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, you definitely have. Man. I have to say, it's not easy work being on, on the spot every single time. And with such an international sport like cycling, the thing that I have to say is like your pronunciation of names is absolutely top. Oh, thanks. I mean, we've worked <laughs> really, really hard at it. I'm really lucky I've got... My good friend Natalie, who's like my Flemish pronunciation coach. So if there's something and I'm struggling on, I message her and I'm like, hey, how do you pronounce this? But one of my colleagues, Rob Hatch, who's a Eurosport commentator, he's the master. Um, I do my best, but I, you know, I humbly bow to that one. But yeah, that's kind of you. Thank you. All right, Marty, so this is what we're going to do in this segment. We're going to talk just generally about what's going on all over the world. But I want to know from you, since you've got your, your hand on the pulse over there in the United Kingdom, what is going on with cyclocross right now over there? I think this weekend, lots of local races, lots of local leagues. Let's. I want to talk about Anna Kay from a Spurs of Foot Logic, first of all. Came into the barriers. Helen Wyman had said she'd been telling her to bunny hop them. She did. I think both of our reaction, we were just like, whoa, Anna Kay. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I mean, having having worked with Ellen Noble when she first jumped those barriers uh, at Iowa, at the, I think it was at the World Cup, just like you said before, on global television, these riders with, the, with that amount of adrenaline running through their veins and the ability on the women's side, just not a lot of top riders being able to jump the barriers in the front group marty it's like it's crazy and maybe you know probably more about anna's results and stuff like that what is what is her story a little bit because again not a new name to me we've been talking about her for seasons but i'd love to know if you know anything about her backstory a little bit just like she's on her way up i know she's young rider i know she's riding for expurza um just tell us anything that you know about her yeah, Anna's from the northeast of England. She was actually a, a footballer or a soccer player, as as you say over there. She played, I think it was Sunderland Ladies that she was with, discovered cycling, mountain biking, and then got has really kind of stepped up. She was with Story Racing when she came into the back end of last season, then got picked up by the experts of Foot Logics team. And she's just got, you know, just taking leaps and bounds. We saw her in the British Nationals toe to toe with Nikki Bramia. She then had a had a mechanical, so she's the British under twenty three 
cross champion as well. She rode super well in the worlds as well. She's just a real super talent. She's she's a really, really fun rider as well. Uh, whenever we say what well, she did a few course previews last year and it, 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 we say, what's it like? Anna? she was like, it's mint. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, it was mint when she jumped the barriers this weekend live at the first Super Prestige opening round. So mint to her awesome work over here. I think the big thing that I want to talk about, Marty, is the World Championships are coming to the United States in 2022. So not this year, but the year after, we're going to have the World Championships, man. Like, we've got one World Champion, another World Championship, and then, boom, we're here back in the United States. What When I say, hey, we're going to have the World Championships in Arkansas, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, hopefully, I'm going to get an invite to come over. That's, like, the first thing. <laughs> but I think okay. it's good. I think it's great. We've got to continue with the, with the growth that we've got in cyclocross. I can see how big it is over there in the U.S. I remember being over there for Cross Vegas and those sort of events when they really first started. Started. So it's that expectation. It will be that unknown as well for a lot of European riders. I think it will help push the, the events over the next couple of years with riders. Maybe think, all right, I've got to go and do those world early World Cups as well. Get over there, test them out. It, it's it's a good thing for the sport as well. And I think it's a good thing for, for you US riders. Jonathan Page, yourself, Katie Compton. Will we get that that elite man, that that world champion? I know, I know. Well, things to think about. But uh, but yeah, and then the riders, I mean, there was the same kind of host of people that I've been really impressed by this year from Canada. The Canadian side was Magalie Rochette. And then, of course, the, here in the U.S. is Clara Hansinger. They both took wins at this warm-up event that they have at this World Championship track down in Fayetteville. Um, it's the first time they're running a UCI race at this event. They had a race there. It went down. One day was dry. That's the day Magalie won. The next day, an absolute mud fest. I heard one of the muddiest races that anyone has ever done over there. But one other really big takeaway, Marty, was that Logan Owen, who rides for EF, like eight-time national champion, shows up at the race and uh, and comes out, features in the front group for most of the race, uh, ends up fourth on Sunday. I'm not exactly sure where he finished. It's in the top 10 on Saturday. I have to say that this really piqued my interest. Someone that's really dedicated to the road, coming back over to cyclocross off of finishing the Vuelta. I guess my thought is always that, like, a three-week Grand Tour can't be really good for your snappiness, you know? It can't be, you can't feel like you're just popping out of the corners if you've done a three-week Grand Tour. But we were talking about it before, is we have seen some riders come back with success. Yeah, definitely. Lars Bohm being one of them, again, in, in the past, came off the back of the Vuelta and back into Cross as well. So it can be done. The Grand Tour gives you that that super compensation sometimes as well, that big solid base and it's great to see logan coming in i love what ef are doing they're really pushing the boundary in terms of their alternative program and i think come seeing someone like logan coming back into cyclocross i think we're going to see it more and more like some mike turnison these sort of riders coming back into cyclocross now that uh, team managers are not going to be so much worried about hey you're going to hurt yourself riding cross you know but you know you go down <laughs> right. in the field you kind of generally roll over get yourself back up you go down in the peloton you tend to just you know hope you haven't broken anything so i think they've been a real game changer with wout van Aert, matthew vanderpool i think we're going to see more riders come in excited to see what logan can do good luck to him anything else that you want to catch up on today marty I think that's about it. I'm looking forward to this weekend. So we got to the Super Prestige in Bowen. We go there. Matthew van der Poel, Kim van der Steenen were winners last year. And a great going back to Switzerland. I love Switzerland. So big weekend ahead. Back into the World Cups. More Super Prestige. Ah, I'm loving it. I'll be talking to you this weekend, Marty. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Next up is my man, Erwin Vervecken, the three-time world champ. I want to call this segment... Erwe Vrveka Hatverdeka Vrveka because when Erwin won the 2007 World Championships in Belgium, the commentator at the end of the race said Hatverdeka Vrveka, which I think means hot damn Vrveken, um, but in that nice like Belgian West Flanders slang. So I'm excited to get into this piece with Erwin. He has so much depth in the sport and so much knowledge about what's going on today. We talk about a bunch of 
different things from the series races and the women's racing, the men's dynamics, all types of good stuff. I hope you like this piece. Erwin, thank you so much for, for joining us. It's a pleasure to, to talk to you. So I wanted to just get a sense of things that are going on in European cyclocross because we get so much information about cyclocross, but it's all translated. And I thought, you know what would be better? Let's get a person that has, has so much experience in the sport, and that is from Belgium, to be able to chat and, um, and just kind of go through stuff. So this year we have five different series happening in Belgium, I guess in Europe, oh, right. But there's the Ethias Cross, the Sodal Classics, the DVV Trophy, the Super Prestige, and then there's the World Cup. Uh, tell me what's going on with them. And like, uh, if you had to rank them, I'd just be curious to know, like as a rider or as a European which ones mean the most to you and which are the most prestigious? Well, for sure, the World Cup is still the most prestigious because uh, there you have uh, the American riders. Huh? You had the two World Cups in uh, in, in the States. Uh, you have a much more international field. Uh, we also see uh, riders from, from Italy, from France. Uh, we don't all come to, to Belgium every weekend. So the World Cup is for sure, um, yeah, given the, the the spread of the of the events over over the whole season and 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 over different countries is is the more prestigious one. And then you have two officially recognized uh, rankings uh, series uh, by the UCI, which is a Super Prestige and the DVV uh, Trophy, a, a, a very old uh, series. It's it's the oldest one, um, um, which is the most prestigious of both. Well, hard to say. Uh, they have different courses, um, different uh, type of races. Uh, but yeah, most of the Belgian riders and also a lot of foreigners come here to do both. Let's say 10 years ago, they were uh, outstanding uh, towards the rest of, of the, the event because they all, were all live on television. Nowadays in Belgium, every race is live on television. TV stations are battling <laughs> to have the TV rights uh, for Belgian cyclocross. So that's a good thing. Then the, the two other uh, series you're mentioning, uh, Etias Cross and uh, Sudal Classics, but Sudal Classics will change name this year because it's uh, Sudal is, a, is also a brand huh? uh, and it's one of their products they are promoting this year. So the, the new name will be a uh, Rectivit series. They are not recognized by the UCI, which means that they can't have an official ranking. There's no points or uh, time ranking. They're just a series of events under the same umbrella with the same sponsor. Uh, that's the difference. What about the Ethias Cross? Yeah, Ethias Cross is, is uh, the new brand uh, which uh, was called uh, Brico Cross last year. It's a series of eight events, seven of them in Belgium, one in uh, in Holland, of the World Championships in uh, in Hulst. It was the last race uh, Mathieu did yeah, last season, beginning of this year, before he jumped on his road bike. And yeah, it's, it's uh, the newest series, only exists since three years, I guess, but it combines like uh, a lot of new events with very motivated organizers. So it's open to everybody and uh, it's, it's uh, the newest one in the, in the row. Let's talk about what's already happened. The World Cup has kicked off the official cyclocross season, I suppose. I guess Eli Easterby is the rider from the men's side. And then on the women's side, we really haven't seen the biggest riders yet come out. A lot of them didn't travel to the United States for the World Cup, which will be hard to know if that will hurt them or not. But I'd be curious to know, I guess, what people are saying about Eli's ability to win both races. And are we looking at another very dominant rider? Obviously, he has great Palmares. He's won a lot before. But I'd just be curious to know what people are saying about uh, about that. Yeah, well, for some reason, so the, the two American World Cups, uh, they were, of course, live on television even in prime time huh, because we had them in the evening but for some reason a lot of the best women didn't travel this year towards uh, the states which is a pity for the sport me myself i've i've been doing uh, a lot of trips over to the states when there was even was even no, nothing to to win in uh, terms of uh, uci points or, or yeah uh, a world cup ranking so I really feel sad for the organizers. I know both of them very well, and, and I think they deserve better. But on the other hand, we've seen new women winning these events, and, and it's now up to them to defend their ranking and their first position in the World Cup uh, in the upcoming weeks uh, when, when the World Cup is back in Europe. So two events uh, have, have been ridden, two out of nine. If they do well, they, they can probably win the World Cup because uh, yeah, women like uh, Sonne Kant she just starts the season and uh, it will be hard for her to, to catch up on, on, on she lost in, uh, in the States, which yeah. she did last yeah. year. 
Yeah, as well. Yeah. We haven't seen uh, Anna Marie Wurst, so uh, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. And I, and yeah, and I'd love to hear about what the papers are saying about uh, Eli Easterby and and that dominance that he's had already this season. What do, what is your take on it, at least? To be honest, I didn't expect him to go that hard early in the season. Don't forget that he beat it, uh, uh, Tom Arts, who was uh, by second. But like a far end behind, huh? he, he, in the last quarter of the race, he made a difference uh, purely on, on, on a good condition. Uh, it seems to be like, the same like uh, Tom Ars did uh, uh, last season. So yeah, Eli is a bit of you young kid uh, trying to, to break the dominancy of, uh, of Mathieu and Wout. And um, yeah, curious to see how he will uh, be when, when Mathieu is, is starting again on the 22nd of uh, October. What level uh, Iserbeet will reach uh, next to Mathieu and, and to see if he can beat him in the next races the next week and sure meet each other and curious to see what will be the best then. What do you think Tom Pitcock's cyclocross season will look like? And I know in the past, Tom Pitcock has been a thorn in Eli Iserbeet's side. And we saw last year Pitcock starting to ride into the, you know, towards the front and hanging with, uh, with Vanderpool a bit during those last late season February races. What's your take on that? Pitcock was for sure very good uh, in February. So at Worlds and then the weeks afterwards uh, ending the season. Um, he, he had a bit of troubles in the beginning of the season reaching uh, a good level. I think up till New Year, his best position in, uh, in an open elite race with, uh, with the pros was a uh, fourth position. I think, if I remember well, it was in Gavre. And, and normally in, in, in the, the battles between Isabit and, uh, and, and Pitcock on the U23 level, uh, World Cups or, or Super Prestige DVV series, in general, Pitcock was the better one, uh, even though Isabit won twice the World Championships. But if you take the number of, of wins Pitcock towards Isabit, I think he's, uh, he's in the lead. So if, if he can make the progress that Isabit made this season, um, I'm sure he will also... Uh, yeah, step up uh, towards Mathieu van der Poel, but even then, I doubt that anybody can be close to, to van der Poel this season, uh, uh, same as was last season. So it's not really motivating for riders being next to him uh, at the start. Well, and I spoke to some of those riders at the World Cups. Uh, Lars Vanderhaar in particular was one that I interviewed about this specific subject. And I think he felt very motivated that Vanderpool would, would not be at the races and, and Wout Van Aert would not be at the races. If yeah, I'm, I'm sure they were all uh, very keen on taking uh, the win because uh, once Van der Poel is, is, is getting back in business in, in, let's say, three, four weeks, then probably they will ride for second place. Yeah. Uh, and that's hard to handle. Well, we, we were also in our time racing against Van Ness, who won also probably eight out of out of ten races. But from time to time, you could beat him. Nowadays, uh, Mathieu last season, he was beaten actually once because the second loss was due to uh, a crash. It's it's very hard to, to ride against him, and I, I'm sure that a lot of riders. Uh, uh, once they they are at the start line and and getting towards the, the yeah after the start uh, in in the first lap when Mathieu attacks I don't think uh, they they even make an effort to to try and follow him because you know that <laughs> you're killing yourself yeah and that's probably not so good for the sports huh a lot of people love more women cyclocross at this moment because there's much more competition between uh, different riders. Uh, I think if we take last season, we saw probably 10 different riders winning the different uh, series events. Uh, even though I like Mathieu a lot and he's a very nice guy, but uh, it's, it's, it's probably not so good for the sport. Yeah, I definitely have to say that I was a big fan of the women's races last year. Just the battles. It just yeah kept you on the edge of your seat, not knowing who would win and the great battles that make cyclocross so much fun to spectate. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. And uh, I look forward to catching up with you each week as we do this segment for the podcast. It was a pleasure. Whoo, man, Erwin brought it. Even I learned a ton of stuff from him over the, the course of that conversation. It was really, really cool to be able to catch up with him. I have a ton of respect for him. I was just getting my career kicked off when Erwin retired, and I remember racing with him at the tail end when he came out to Wisconsin and did um, some of the races in the USGP series, and I was able to be on the podium with him. And he came over to Gloucester when the race was just getting going as the world champion. He won his first world title in 2001 at my first junior world championships. 
just really cool to be able to sit here and have a conversation with him and learn so much about European cyclocross. Next up is the man, Lars van der Haar, another rider that I've been able to share the podium with and create a friendship with over the years. If you guys have seen him race, you know the panache that he's got. Uh, really excited for you guys to listen to this one. Lars, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I did a little bit of research, and I'm going to rattle off a couple of accolades that you had. The one time junior national champion, two times U23 national champion, and twice also as an elite. We got the 24 overall World Cup win, three times podium at the World Championships, once in Louisville, once in Tabor, and then also in Zolder. You were the elite European champion in 2015. Sounds good. And and you've won a slew of other races. I don't know how often that you're reminded of this, how all these these victories are accolades. Well, only in interviews, but since Mathieu and uh, some other good riders came over, it's less and less. At 28, you are now the rider that is of that generation. So I was racing against you eight years ago, but now at 28, you're... You're the older side of the cyclocross peloton, which I find to be quite surprising. Like, if you were a road rider, you would just be getting going. Yeah, that's Um, true. And so I guess the question is, like, what is the mindset now? What is the sense that you have when you're racing in the bunch at 28? Well, you don't really notice because you're just racing against the guys that are there. It doesn't really matter if they're young or old. But, uh, yeah, it's just strange that nowadays, almost every race, I'm the oldest guy in the top 10. So uh, even on the podium in Tavor, the elite podium was younger than the under 23 podium in days so that was quite shocking i think but uh yeah i think mostly i just do my thing and i try to beat whoever it is that's in front of me and uh but yeah there are some guys that came over pretty young and killing it so it's been quite difficult but uh yeah well, I had to say that I was I was going to say this at the beginning, but over my years of racing, right, you come over as an American to Europe and you're over there and you're sort of like a fish out of water when you're in Europe. Also, like, right, I didn't win every single race, so I don't have insane respect, but I have enough respect because I'm in the racing. But you were always one of the dudes that like looked out, like punched it out, said hi and I was gonna just talk a little bit about your personality because I think that some people that are listening to this probably don't know you. Would you consider yourself like an extrovert? I'm one of those people that wants everybody to like me. Yeah. So and I like a lot of people. Yeah. So I just <laughs> hate silences. So then I just make a joke or right. whatever. I mean, I'll never forget the first race. This is another 23, and you're standing at the, where you get your uh, numbers. Getting my number, and then Sven was in the line, so nice to just get his number, and then. I would just make a joke and everybody would look at me like, what is he saying? You yeah. know, like, it's just been me all the time and I, I like to make it fun. I mean, serious enough and I'm nervous enough for myself as well. So <laughs> I don't want to make it any more nervous. So maybe just crack a joke. And I just remember warming up and we'd always have like just a, hey, how's it going? Like, I know all the guys, but it wasn't always so casual, so friendly. Like, hey, nice to see you. So yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, well, I had a good time in Vegas. I think that's the first time we encountered each other. So Yeah, we had some good battles yeah. there. Yeah. I was going to talk about that a little bit because uh, typically, like, the the older riders phase out of cyclocross, right? They go over to uh, the road. I know that you have already raced on the road. I remember you, in North America, you did the Tour of Alberta one year before the cross season. I didn't do it the same year as you. I did it the year before. I remember it was really horrible conditions. Oh, that was the most horrible, <laughs> the coldest race I've ever done. I didn't finish it in the uh, end because two degrees, rain, I mean, echelons, just horrible. But, yeah. Yeah. We did it. Yeah, so I guess the question is, like, what do you think about when you look at the road racing? I loved it the way I did it. Yeah. So in preparation of cross. Uh, but at one point, there was a point in my previous team uh, with uh, Giant Alpacine that I had to do too many races when I had injuries or things like that. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, that didn't like it so much anymore. But I loved that I had the opportunity to do a Paris Roubaix once. I loved the opportunity that I did the Dauphiné once. And I think that. The difference is, though, that when you do a lot of the road races that they do, like the BNC program, the races are perfect. I can do them. They're on my level. But as soon as you go to a Dauphiné or a Roubaix, which is a World Tour level, it's just such a big difference. The change in level is so high. I mean, we're going uphill here in the Dauphiné, and I mean, sky is just killing it on the front, and you're just like, what is happening here, yeah. you know? like. I thought I was a climber, but there were like 150 climbers that were, even the sprinters were better than me in climbing almost, you know what I mean? It was just, yeah, it was so strange. And I do like to do the road. 
or yeah. just hate racing in the road on the ro in the rain? For me, I always felt like the training that I would get from the road racing was like the best thing that I could do to get my engine bigger, right? So I always felt like it was just days of motor pacing. I'd literally just be out there like, you know, suffering just, yeah, I'm not making the front group, but I'm in, you know, the second or the third group and I'm just sitting there just like, I don't need to do anything. I just need to suffer here and that's going to get me ready for the cross season. I think it was the best training that I could ever do. So how many race days do you think you did during the summer? Oh, that's a good question. I think I would have done about 25 to 30 days of racing on the road. I did one road race less because of my marriage. I was going to say. Uh, normally I would do all four of the stage races that we do. And there are two big ones in it that are like the Belgium Tour mm -hmm. and uh, Tour de Wallonie. And then two little ones. But I actually like the little ones better because yeah. it's full gas from start to finish. And right. they're a lot harder than yeah. a Tour de of Belgium or whatever. Like the bigger races you see on TV are normally not as hard than the races you don't see on TV. Yeah. Where the level is a little bit lower, yep. it's just a constant yeah. fight. Yeah. Let's talk about your summer. You got married, man. <laughs> Through that. <laughs> what was that like? That went down maybe in June? Uh, no, July. Just July. July, yeah. Okay. After the Nationals uh, on the road, we did it. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was a beautiful day, I assume, a big day for you. Yeah, it was. Uh, we had so much luck with the weather because we did the ceremony outside and we, we were just done and then started pouring rain, so it was perfect. And Man, you got the best of both worlds. You got yeah. a nice day and then they always say it's good luck if it rains on your Is wedding. It? Oh, so, well, that's good. So then. you got like yeah, we got everything doubled up. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, it was a beautiful day and I, I remember saying to Lucy, I was like, yeah, Lucy, don't get angry if I don't cry or anything, you know, because yeah, I'm not really... A, crying person but uh, I hadn't even seen her but through a crack of like the bushes I saw a white dress coming I was crying like a baby so <laughs> That's I mean so great, man. yeah it was I it was, cried at my wedding too yeah, it, it was feel the, better it was the best day of my life but it was so emotional I mean I don't think I've got tears for another 10 years yeah. it's ridiculous <laughs> it was just like even doing my vows I was just like, <laughs> like yeah. getting it all Tough. out yeah. yeah but it was beautiful just to back up for the listeners, Lars married fellow racer, also a, a world champion yeah, and a quite, a quite yeah. an accomplished cyclist, uh, Lucy Garner. So pretty cool. So were you guys split time between the U UK and the Netherlands or do you guys no, live full time? No, we live in Holland. In and Holland. she goes back a lot when I'm not there. So okay. like when I was in Mallorca a couple of weeks ago, she was two weeks with her parents uh, and seeing her friends and everything. So she will go back a lot more than I do. I normally only go one time because it's just difficult for me to go there. And I have to be honest, I find the training there a little bit dangerous. Yeah. I so um, I, I'd rather train at home. This brings me to my next question. It's about your dog. Is Doggy. It, Doggy. Yeah. Is it, what is, what's his name? It's uh, Robbie. Robbie, that's right. Yeah. It's a uh, Jack Russell? Jack Russell, black and tan. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Is your nickname in Europe on, on, sometimes I think I hear the commentators calling you the, the Jack, Jack Russell. Russell. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh -huh. What's that all about? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, I think it came from uh, Paul Heerijgers. He once said like, oh yeah, you're like a pit bull. No, like a Jack Russell. He <laughs> bits in your ankle and he doesn't let go anymore. You know, like uh, I think that was it a little bit in the last laps a lot of the times where it went so hard and I just dug in and didn't let go so that's where it came from a little bit so i hear more like go jaggy than i hear go lars so, yeah <laughs> who takes care of the dog because you guys are both traveling racing and whose dog is it because there's is there like a f well well this this was the thing lucy <clears throat> was scared of dogs very scared okay. so i was said i always wanted a dog but i said we'll do it after my career or we'll do it after you stop because i like really like german or mechels or shepherds i really like those mm -hmm. So I wanted like a big dog, but uh, then Lucy suddenly, like when my parents got a dog again, because they didn't have a dog for a while, then she really like, oh, I really love this dog, I really like it. And she wasn't scared anymore. And then like uh, one day I came back and she's like, I want a dog. And I, as she said, I looked on the internet, I want a dog, I want to go tomorrow. It's like, oh, whoa, I mean, take it easy, okay, you know? But yeah, okay, it happened. So uh, we, we went there and yeah, okay, this, I said then I want them what well, then I want a small dog I mean it's just a lot easier to take everywhere yeah but I do want a dog that does look like a dog so we went for Jack Russell then and I thought it was also quite funny with my name <laughs> nickname of course so yeah we went there and we saw this little puppy was lost from his nest and uh, just from a farmer not nothing with papers or anything just a we say like a garbage dog, you know, like right. the ones that that last forever. <laughs> right. So um, and then I she was like, yeah, I really want it. So I took her down to the driver and said, okay, Lucy, 
it's fine, but we need to make some rules. It's going to be your dog, and you're going to have to take care of it, and it's going to be your responsibility if we're not there that you take <laughs> like care that it goes somewhere or whatever. And yeah, 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 okay. So we bought the dog. I mean, within a week, it was my dog as well, of course. I mean, yeah. I loved the little thing. So, yeah, it became our dog, and it worked out really well. My parents can take it uh, 99 out of 100 times that we're gone. Okay. And a lot of the time, she's gone, and I'm home, and I'm gone, and she's home. I wanted to know what you think that your best performance is, because I have a memory of a race that you did that I was at that I thought was quite possibly the best that I ever saw you race. Oh, that's difficult. Because I really also think I did a super race where I didn't win okay. in, in Zolder, where I got second in the world with Wout van Aert. That was. I mean, I, I think everything went perfect for me there, except I made one huge mistake for the last climb. I thought I shifted down to my inner ring, and I didn't, and that's why I had to get off the bike. Mm. And that's why I couldn't sprint against Wout. I will never say that I could have won, mm. but I would have loved to be able to have a, a, a sprint against Wout. And, that kept me up some nights, but yeah. I still believe that was one of my best races because I took all the risks, I did everything I think right, except that one moment I made my mistake. Yeah, and 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 Falkenberg, of course. I mean, I really liked dominating that race for three years in a row. That was that was really yeah. really nice. Valkenburg was the one that yeah. I had uh, written down here. Was I think that for me, uh, watching you rip that descent and warm up because we had to do it a couple of times the yeah. day before. You're absolutely flying. I consider myself a decent, like, I, yeah, I'll rip a descent. Like, that's not where I'm getting dropped. But I remember leaving slightly demoralized after and, like, telling everyone, like, yeah, Lars went down the descent pretty much breakless. It almost looked like he was pedaling during Wasn't down that it. the first year I was doing discs, though? Wasn't that, like, the big yes. difference? Yes. Because I remember the first year I rode discs there and I had to go down it in the race against Powell's. And I just overtook him in the descent because I could break like 10 times later. Yeah, that's, that's even still, ridiculous. breaks aside, yeah. you were absolutely riffing that descent. And I, I literally remember, like, I was scared. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep it PG, but I was scared <laughs> um, by how fast you were going. And I thought, yeah, okay, well, I'm, I'm not any good and he's great. And then you went on and you won. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a good day. I wanted to ask a little bit about Vanderpool because I feel like that would be kind of, it would be remiss of me to not ask about it. You're a world champion rider. You're top in the world. Like you've been in the top 10 pretty much your entire career of the UCI ranking. Vanderpool comes along and, you know, you are, you're the guy. You're the national champion of the Netherlands. I'm just curious about what your mindset is because we've had the same thing happen in the United States with someone like Katie Compton uh, that's come in and had been very dominant I could just start in the beginning. I mean, we saw him coming at the New Orleans and he won everything. And we thought, like, oh, the junior is going to be difficult. And then he won everything at the junior. And we said, oh, it's going to be difficult at the under-23. And he's won everything with the under-23. And then he decided to go to the world championship in the elite, which was my world championship in Tabor, where I was going to win. And no, I, I didn't. So, I mean, they came over and they, like, made everybody look ridiculous. I mean, I was... I think the only one closest then, because I got third, I think. I only got beaten by Wout in the last lap. But uh, And mean, that was the youngest world champion yeah, ever. ever. Yeah, it was just, uh, I think, it's, you don't accept it, but you do have a way like, okay, he's so good, and you try to change something in your training, maybe do a bit more. I think everybody did that. I think you see that everybody's level went up the last years. Yes. That's all because of those guys, of course. I mean, I will always try and, and, and beat him and see if I get chances to do so. I of mean, course. I won one time in Hoogerheide where I got the chance. And, yep. But it's difficult to go head to head with Van der Poel. It's just, yeah. yeah. But I am happy that this year he showed how good he was on the road. Because I, I, I mean, I, we, I too. <laughs> we got these people saying, oh, why can't you get close to Van der Poel? Or why can't you guys do this or that? I mean, and then we try to explain, well, his level is just really high. It's not like we're doing any, not nothing. You know? yeah. I mean, we're all training full gas. We're all doing everything yeah. for it. It's not like Mathieu is doing more than that we are doing. Right. And then he got on the road and he, he yeah. I mean, he makes the world tour people look at five. So yeah. it's yeah. like, then they suddenly realize like, oh, wow, the level that you guys are getting is actually really high, you know, because we are only in half a minute or, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. they, they accept it now better, which is happy for us. Yeah, I think for Van Eric too, you can see that it almost is like vindicating. Yeah. Because I think he took a lot of crap for being second consistently. 
And I think that all of you have like, yeah, people are just like, wow, there's, there's not any good cross riders and that's why he has yeah. such a dominance. And that's just not, that's just not what's going on. No, no, exactly. like, it's not, you guys are all class riders and it's a very high level. It's, it would literally, people would, people can't believe it. I mean, yeah, the level is like you said, the but highest. But you can see it when we also go on the road. I mean, Quinton wins big stage races, uh, Tone does top five or fours in the big races like Tour de Belgium and Mononi. That's right. So we're all got a really high level. I mean, it's not like they are the only <laughs> ones that, that are doing well, but they are doing it a little bit better. That's the only thing you can say yeah. about that. Do you think you'll see more road riders coming over to race cross? Because cross riders have had a ton of success on the road this year. There's just yeah, been so I, many riders. Yeah, but I think it's very difficult to, way, to do it the other way around. That's I right. mean, a cross rider has to be a good road rider to be a good cross rider. True. But a road rider is not typically a good cross rider because it's a complete being a completely different type of rider. You have to be explosive, you have to be technical. And I mean, a lot of the road riders are not as technical as us. I mean, jumping a pavement for some is... <laughs> A difficulty it doesn't mean that they can't ride their bike hard I mean yeah. they can still beat me and a lot of others but uh, yeah it's, it's very difficult to go from road to cross but I mean from mountain bike perspective you can still choose road yeah. or cross last question before we get into some question and answers getting to know you for you to die happy with your cycling career what is left Oh, that's difficult. <laughs> I know, big question. <laughs> well, yeah, of course, I really, really want to become world champion one time, but I'm not going to die unhappily if it doesn't happen, happen. I mean, I just want to maybe find my own time that I want to stop and not have to be forced yeah. to stop. I think that, that would make me really happy. So there's not one result that you're like, man, I really want. Well, of course, I want to win every race that's there. But I mean, I, I really would like to win a world championship. I would like to win a Zonnehoven, which is a race I love. Yeah. I mean, it's the best race for me. Yeah. But that's not going to make me more dying happy. Mm -hmm. It's just I would love to make the, uh, my own decision of stopping my career. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to present some <clears throat> we'll call them hypothetical scenarios. OK. And then you're going to get a couple of different options to answer. So A, B, C, or D. First up, do you like Beyonce? Let's just start there. Oh, my girlfriend. My wife. Sorry, my wife does. Yeah, okay. she's, she's totally in love with Beyonce. All right, then. So let's start this up. Okay. So you're in a dark alleyway and you're walking down the street. Boom. You run into someone. You realize that it's a woman and her things go all over the place. So you still don't know who it is. You're picking up their things and then you help them out to the light that's on the street and you realize it's Beyonce. And she says, man, that was so nice. It was great. It was really nice of you to be able to help me like that. I'm so sorry that we ran into each other. I have a show on uh, Saturday night and I was wondering if you would want to come to the show. You have a World Cup race on Sunday. Do you, A, tell Sven, who's the team boss, is, is, that's your manager, Sven. Do you tell Sven that you're gonna miss the team dinner on Saturday night for an important biographical documentary that's playing on the History Channel? Do you B, pay some strangers to take Sven out for a couple of drinks on Saturday night so you can sneak out and see the show? Do you C, pull the fire alarm at the hotel and fake an injury? Or D, do you miss the Beyonce blowout and just hit dinner with the crew? Huh. Oh, that's a difficult one. I mean, I I can't. I really can't say no for Lucy's sake. So I mean, Lucy would kill me if I would have Beyonce tickets and not use them. But I miss like maybe an E where I could say I let Lucy go with somebody of the staff in the team. But well, I think B will never happen because Sven doesn't get drunk. I might just pull the fire alarm then. <laughs> okay, all right. So you're you're year long roommates with Toon Ertz, who is the Belgian national champion. For anyone that doesn't know, whether this is true or not, this is hypothetical. So you guys are heading out for a course pre ride, and in the first couple of turns, he chops you in the corner, meaning like he cuts you off, and you go flying over the handlebars, and you land super hard. And you like look up, and you're like, dude, what the heck? Like, what were you doing? But he doesn't know. He just keeps on riding. He kind of looks back. He gives you that look, like. Shouldn't have tried to come in like that. Do you A, hide his shoes on the morning of the race, B, sprinkle some Tabasco hot sauce in his chamois cream when he's not looking and mix it in, do you C, steal the batteries off his SRAM derailleurs just before he's heading to the race start, or do you D, you make a mental note but you let it slide this time? 
Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. This comes very close to what happened two years ago in Waterloo when I crashed on the road, which wasn't really his fault, <laughs> but I think I would actually just put an empty battery of SRAM in his radio. I think that's just the best to do. I mean, <laughs> that's just, yeah, that's the best thing to do. Okay, so you go out, your season's over, you go out to dinner with Lucy, and the waiter spills dinner literally all over her. You guys got dressed up, nice dinner, you guys get dinner spilled all over you. Do you, A, find the waiter, like do you get up and find the waiter and give him like a proper Dutch shakedown, meaning like you kind of like, you rough him up a little bit. B, do you tell Lucy to hang tight, you sprint run down to the local clothing shop and get her a new set of clothes. Do you C, brush it off and keep on moving because you guys are cyclocrossers and that's fine to be dirty. Or D, do you ask for the food to go and let Lucy clean up and have a nice dinner at your house in your pajamas and watch a movie? Well, none of those will happen. Well, in the end, D will happen. But the real thing that will happen is that Lucy will kill that waiter. <laughs> I will definitely not have to get up because Lucy will definitely rough that guy up until he will be giving his clothes to Lucy. So that's... That's going to be the real answer. And then, yes, in the end, we will eat at home in our pajamas. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, Lars, that is what we have today. I want to thank you for being on the show and thank you for being a sport. Thank you for being an incredible rider and a good advocate for the sport. Thank you so much. Thank you. Man, what a great interview with Lars. Such a good sport and super fun to get those questions in at the end. Hope you guys liked this show. Um, if you do, please subscribe. Send us out on social media. Let your friends know about the show. Check in with us next week because we got another action-packed episode that I'm really, really pumped to bring to you guys. Thank you again so much for listening and have a great week.